Up next is our question and answer session with Ray Rice and Dr. Marianne Engel. So Dr. Marianne Engel is a licensed clinical psychologist and sports psychologist whose clients have been elite and professional athletes on pro teams. Currently on the faculty of the NYU Langone Medical School, she has held faculty appointments at Harvard, MIT, and UCSD. Dr. Engel is co-founder and partner at Encourage.com. Please welcome Dr. Engel and Ray Rice back for a Q&A session. Hello, it's such a pleasure to be here with all of you. I hope you've really enjoyed everything you've heard because um, as students, you don't always get to hear such outstanding speakers and you've got it today. And Ray, thank you again for being here and being so open and direct. Um, my first question for you is that if you now could speak to your 16 year old self, what do you wish somebody had said to you? What would you say to yourself? Um, I, I wish someone at 16 would have, would have told me that asking for help was something was, was normal. You know, I, I just, yeah, my 16 year old self, you know, I'm 33 now, but I felt like at, you know, at 16, I felt older than what I really was because of the, um, the responsibilities I had in my household and, you know, um, just foreshadowing, I said, I was, a you know, I was a, I was the man of the house at 11 years old and I became a boy at 21. That might have sounds crazy, but at right in that middle point where you're 16, you wish someone would have, you know, I wish I had the, the knew the resources that I know now where, you know, um, I, I talk to a counselor, I, I speak to my psychiatrist and it just made me, it, it actually slowed things down for me. It, it's probably the best thing I've done in my, you know, I, I would say, I don't want to call myself old, but younger, um, getting up there years of just understanding that experience, these things happen. And um, the best teacher now is, is experience. And I'm, I'm thankful to be able to share these experience of, of saying, asking for help is normal. I, I mean, it might sound cliche that it sounds easy, but until you're in that bind, you like looking left to right and don't know where to go, that's when it's really going to make sense. And I, I hope today that this makes sense and it makes sense before something, you know, before it spirals out of control. And that's kind of where I was. Thank you so much. And to all of you listening, I think what he's saying to you is that if there are things that are going on that you really can't figure out or that you are affecting other people with, ask for help or talk to other people about it. It's not a secret. For Ray, it was a secret because for him, life was so intense. But one of the things that I want to talk about, Ray, is how successful you've been. You know, from the time you were a kid, you've worked really, really hard at your sports, at your athletics, at your loyalty to your family. And sadly, nobody ever taught you how to deal with frustration and anger, right? Yeah. And and, and I think as a society, we're not good at that. And, and the people, all of you listening, this is not just men, this is not just athletes. Women have this issue too, and girls do. And um, I was hoping, Ray, that you might say something to both the girls and the boys who are listening about anger, rage, frustration, and how it can be, you know, a lot of athletes um, also have a lot of emotional, um, emotionality, shall we say. And, and sometimes, you know, it just, it, it just goes with um, the program, but it doesn't have to overwhelm you. It doesn't have to be who you become, who you are. So can we talk a little bit about that, Ray? Oh, yes. I mean, um, 
I can give a better example, and I think that this does apply to, you know, whether you're an athlete or not. It, it has something to do with if you love something, and I'm sure we all do, when you love something and you become time consumed with it, you're going to do whatever you can to be successful at it. But for me in sports, I, I thought that by playing sports, like, I, can, I can tackle someone or run over someone and not get in trouble. <laughs> and, you know, like I said, we were what we've seen. And this is probably the not so proud moments because in sports, like, you get pretty – like, football, when I was playing – I started playing when I was seven years old. And – there were times in games where, you know, you kind of get praised for hurting someone. And you think of that emotion, like where you can hurt someone and not get in trouble. You multiply that. Th those actions don't change, you know, unless something – you pump the brakes on it. Now, I'm sitting here in a position where I'm the commissioner of a youth football league, and I will have the authority if I find out a coach is teaching that someone is going out there to try to maliciously hurt someone, I have to remove that coach, possibly even go to the extremity of getting the police involved. So when you're talking about someone that has went full circle with it, I think that now that I've gotten help and made it, it's normal to have emotion it's not normal to take out those emotions on people. That's why you have clinical help. That's why you have, you know, that's why you have guidance counselors. That's why you have coaches. That's why you, there are more resources out there today than I've ever seen. The one thing you can't do as well is put like, I've realized that it's, it's, when you go to pour your emotions out on social media, that's a different vulnerability right there. You're almost putting yourself out there to be bullied, to be antagonized, to be talked about. So there's certain things that I believe that you should keep private. And if you need the help, it doesn't make you less of a person. It just makes you stronger that you know deep down inside, deep, 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 deep in there, if you're asking for help, you know that that's the, the start to revamping what's going on. But you're only going to get to that place by settling down and starting fresh. And um, I'm thankful to have a fresh start. My fresh start is not on the football field, but it is with two kids and it is just living everyday life. I have to live what I'm talking the rest of my life. And I have no problem with that bullseye on my back because you know what? I'm going to score a lot of real points, not fantasy points, by being <laughs> able to live out what I'm talking about. So that's where I'm at with it. Thank you. That's great. Well, back to social media just quickly. Um, that's, I, I know everybody listening to this has some feelings about social media and the pressure. There, there's joys with social media and the pressure. And, um, and I think, please listen to Ray's advice about being very careful about what you post on social media. First of all, you know that colleges look at your social media. So make sure you haven't put anything there that colleges are gonna say, we don't want you. But the other thing is think about your own emotional status. And if you start putting your whole heart and soul out there in social media, as Ray says, you are just asking to be demolished. So be careful. Ray, I have another question for you. And that is, um, what advice would you give to the people who love and cherish the relationships with their partners, their boyfriends, their girlfriends, who do have these issues with, with anger. Um, what kind of advice can you give them? Well, without sounding like a relationship expert, but what the best advice I can give is 
there's a word in there. It's called respect. Yeah. And um, when you when you, you can define respect in many different ways, if you really call yourself loving someone and caring for them, and that love usually shows when you're not in sync, because if you're truly in sync, someone says they're going to take the higher route of apologizing or taking a step forward. The way it goes in my household now, where I'm going to give you a live example on what works for us. And okay. me and my wife have sports is in our house. So what makes sense for us is time out and time in. And when you love and respect someone, you have to be a good listener. And sometimes being a good listener, you're not going to, like, when if, if you're being told about yourself. You don't want to hear it. You don't want to hear it. <laughs> no, you don't. So we time out because I know that if my wife is talking, I can't be on the other side of crafting my response to that. So I time myself out knowing that I don't want to have an emotional response. I might not like what she's saying, but I respect her enough to listen. Because if I'm crafting a response, I'm really not listening. That's right. Our rule of thumb is I got to time myself back in before we go to bed because I don't like to sleep on it. We're not going to push it under the rug. But I, when I do that, I might have to go work out, go blow some steam off. But you know what? It's a respect factor. I listened. And I think I, I didn't listen early on in my right. you know, career. And, and that's part of the reason why you sweep a lot of problems underneath the rug. And um, so I think if you, if you truly love your partner, just become a better listener. And it's it, like all these things sound easy. They really do sound easy. But, <laughs> and another thing is I would, I mean, cause I'm always social media cognizant now. I would say, if you truly love your partner, I, I'm okay with, you know, a picture of you together, but your whole relationship should not be on social media. Absolutely. You know, and um, I'm going to be a big advocate of that because social media is something that if you give it to them, they run with it. It's your resume. It's something that became bigger than what it was supposed to be. Right. It was supposed to connect people, but it's used it more as a divisive method at this point. So I'm um, not against it just want to be able to protect the future and let that not be something that's part of your brand. Um, Cause you all, you don't want to be the most successful person. Then they go dig back 20 years and say, okay, he said this, she said that he went through that. I know what it feels like. So I'm just very cautious of that. But if you respect your partner, be a, be a better listener. Well, I think the importance of privacy and respect is um, just, it's, it's truly important, truly, truly important. Um, one of the things that I've heard you say, and I loved it, is that vulnerability is a superpower. It is. Can you talk about that just for a few minutes? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think vulnerability being a superpower, I think we all have a superhero in us and, uh, I think my my superhero path was being vulnerable. I was like the almighty guy, I can lift, I can run. But being vulnerable allowed me to feel someone else's pain and allowed me to feel emotion. It allowed me to make me like, you don't have to be so masculine at times. Like, you know, I don't have to feel like I gotta lift the house and go you know, I just, I got to be able to, like, I got to sense when something's wrong. And the only way you're going to sense that is if you're vulnerable. Because if you're not vulnerable, the other side of vulnerable is selfish. And you don't want to be on that side of selfish because when you're selfish, you really can't feel someone else's pain, struggle. It becomes about me, not about us. I think that... um and that superpower to feel someone else's pain is, uh, is how I can detect when, if my wife worked too hard during the day, 
well, you know what? I'll go get the two kids. I'll step in. Me being vulnerable allows me to look at my kid. I can tell if he's flushed. He, let me go take his temperature. You know, but you, if I didn't step outside of myself, if I would have always stayed in warrior mode and, you know, wasn't sensitive to these things, then I would have been selfish. And I think that superpower has allowed me to not only um, be a great dad, it allowed, it's allowed me to be a, you know, a good husband at this point because I, I'm literally doing something that I wasn't used to doing. I was used to going out, you know, ignoring things, taking care of, you know, but I got to take care of football. And now it's just like, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Like, I, I mean, and it's a hard adjustment. It's a hard adjustment coming from, coming from like winning the Super Bowl. And, you know, I still, I mean, I can be open and honest because I still get anxiety during football season. <laughs> and I'm not even playing. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's, and I have to literally see my psychiatrist because there are times when I've faced seasonal depression. Mm -hmm. And it, it's like, I'm able to acknowledge those things because I'm vulnerable to them. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been able to diagnose or go to see somebody about that because I would have been too shameful to say, hey, when football season comes, you know what, Sunday comes, I'm still, like, sometimes I get the itch and sometimes I don't feel well. <laughs> but I end up feeling better now because I'm able to tell you guys about it and let you know that it's real. It's something that it's going to be a part of my life for a long time. Only way I'm going to be able to tackle it is I continue to be vulnerable and ask for help. So it is my superpower. It is your superpower. You know, um, I've, I've worked with a lot of teams, a lot of athletes, and um, the difference between being a successful athlete and wishing to be a successful athlete is not that much. But the difference is the focus on the athletics, the care, the working hard, and the teamwork. Yep. And one of the things that you were talking about was what happens now in your league when you see coaches who are treating the uh, athletes uh, inappropriately. And I love the idea of you retraining these, these coaches if possible, because most coaches don't get that kind of um, learning yeah. that they should about how to make teams really work. And one of the uh, coaches that I once worked with um, in, in California, actually, of one of the top high school teams that won the, world, the um, state championships over and over, I, I asked him, what is your secret? And he said to me, my secret is that I tell my team that we are only as good as our worst player. And if all of us work together to improve everyone, and I'll teach you how to do that, then we can be a winner. Does that make sense to you? I believe, I believe that totally because I've been a part of a lot of winning teams. And um, I can tell you that winning a Super Bowl literally, uh, I mean, I love, I teach life through sports. And I guess this will resonate with the group. My theory on sports is, is very simple now because when you come from sports or anywhere, I know that you can come from, like, there are going to be guys in the locker room that come from my demographic, the projects, bad area, whatever you want to call it, low income. They're going to be from that part of it. There's also going to be guys come from very – you know, affluent neighborhoods that got a lot of money, the farm, or just something that's not like city-like. Truth of the matter is, it doesn't matter where you come from. If you're not willing to sacrifice or give up for the person next to you, and you don't figure it out, you're going to lose. You're not only going to lose games in the, lock, in, the, in the sports field, 
what you're going to do is lose in life. And it's kind of how I kind of see things. I'm like, you know, you see everything going on. You see the, you see the divide going on in the country, but they don't see these moments where people are coming together. And I think we need more of this because a lot of it's not been figured out. But as long as we can control our locker room, we can be voices of change. And that's I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, that's why I got into youth football. That's why I love doing these Zoom calls. That's why um, I just like being out there. But I know that it feels a lot better now because I've taken care of home first. Like I wouldn't be able to do any of what I'm doing and it makes sense because I took care of home first. I did it the reverse way. I was helping people while I was playing because I was ashamed of being home. That might sound crazy. You ever see someone that will help that just wants to help but when you go to peel back the layer they're helping because they're avoiding you don't want to help and avoid at the same time because when you're no longer able to do your job or help and you have to sit in that void that is a sick feeling because when football was no longer there you're talking about some dark days I couldn't even tell you what kind of depression that felt like. That felt like, felt like my world ended. It felt like the world was over. And um, it wasn't until my wife and like my kids and things that I realized that they love me more than myself right now. They love me more than me. How can I give up on them? So, I mean, a lot of powerful things go on when you um, when you're at the bottom, and um, that's when it's truly meaningful to ask for help and surround yourself by people that can really get you out of that rut. Ray, I cannot thank you enough for your wisdom, your openness, and I really hope that all of you who are listening can take this and use it for yourselves. I want to give you just a quick little summary of what we've had and thank you. And then we'll be open to questions. So for all of you who've been listening, Garland said to you, use mistakes to help you learn and move forward. Wayne said to you, self-respect and ethics. Think hard about what's right and what's wrong. Communicate with others. And Steve Young said to you, Culture will eat talent for lunch. Everyone needs to be working on the same goals. And I'm going to say to you, you are so early in your lives. There are so many things that are going to happen. But you're at a point in your lives now where people care about where you're heading. So make sure your values are under control. Make sure you eat well. Make sure you sleep well. Make sure you surround yourself with people who are kind and worth being around. If people are not kind to you, if people are upsetting to you, find other people. <laughs> find ways to move on. Find, find ways to have a very busy, intellectually stimulating, socially stimulating, a lot of good sports, and think hard about your future because the future really is you and we are depending on you guys to take care of the world in the future. So I'm going to hand you back now to Beth and Jason and thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Dr. Engel for, um, your, your questions that you asked, uh, Mr. Rice, those definitely clarified and revealed a lot more, uh, about his story. So now we are opening it up to a question and answer for everyone who has participated on the panel so far. 
Uh, so if you have any questions, direct them to the question and answer um, feature on, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. All right, our first question um, is for Mr. Rice, and it is a little bit of a more uh, personal and deep question. So if you don't mind answering it, though, I think it could uh, clarify a lot of your message and what you've been what you've been sharing. So a Jack is wondering if you can go into more detail of your actions that caused some issues in your career regarding your wife. Uh, and he's sure that many students today might not be aware of the actual situation that you're speaking about. And he thinks it might clarify some of the um, points that you've been trying to make. So if you don't oh, mind. Yes. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, I was, um, uh, just to put it out there without making any excuses, um, I was involved in a domestic violence incident with my wife where um, I was out drinking and I made a terrible decision in hitting my wife. And it was, you know, over a night that went wrong, you know, and there's 50 more things I can go through like before that, but it doesn't excuse anything that it was, uh, it was, it was the worst moment of my life. And that's part of the decision making that led to the downfall of my career. And um, I've, you know, I got cut by the Ravens and it was, I mean, I was with the Baltimore Ravens. I got cut. My, my life unraveled um, over, over that terrible decision, which made me, my running back, it made me run back to my life before all of this. And it had me go back to, it had me go back to like what went wrong early in my life because I, I'm open and candid and honest that I've never been in any trouble with the law. I've never had any kind of wrongs in my life, but a lot went wrong. So, and it, it just, things weren't adding up. How could, how could someone be doing so good, but do so bad, do something so bad? And um, only one that was going to have that answer was me. And I had to go back to the things that hurt me the most. And the things that hurt me the most was uh, normalizing those abnormal things. I mean, my dad was shot and killed when I was a baby. Okay, I mean, I carried that burden. I also learned that now I'm at 33 where my last name's Rice. I found out two years ago that my dad died on my grandfather's birthday. You know, these are things that constantly come up when you're not dealing with things. You know, I also found out that my last name's Rice and not Reed because my dad was in jail. He wasn't there to sign my birth certificate. I, these are the things that when you go back to without making any excuses, these are layers of your life that have to get peeled off. And, um, you know, like even in relationships with my mother, you know, and I, 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 that was a great question that you asked me to go into detail because I didn't want to take up too much time, you know, so I can get to the Q&A and, you know, share some things. But even with my own, like, mother, right, I set a blended family. So my stepfather, I have two younger brothers and a sister. And um, I seen my mom and my stepfather, they were married, but I watched the marriage kind of go in a different direction. And um, that's when I felt like I became the man of the house, when my stepfather left. And my mom started looking for love in all the wrong places. And my sister's father um, is not the same as my stepfather. So you talking about a nice blended family. Um, my sister's father was a full blown, you know, crackhead. And I watched things grow up like that. Like these are the things that I think about growing up, normalizing these abnormal things. And um, by my sister's father being on drugs, you know, I, 
I heard Beth mention bikes and I love bikes. I used to build bikes and it was one of the things I loved to do. But because my sister's father was on drugs, he used to, every bike I built, he stole. So what did I do during these times? I didn't have nowhere to go but sports. So, but to put the clarity in there, that doesn't excuse what I did. It just made, it made it easier for me to be a volcano because I ignored, I ignored everything. And when you ignored everything, eventually you're gonna erupt. And I mean, the old saying is, um, you know, I, I hurt people hurt people. And I wish I would have dealt with my emotions and channeled my energy into getting help um, before my world unraveled. And um, that's why this message is important because we're all volcanoes, you know, but we want to be the ones that, that they can keep under control. Thank you. Uh, Ray, this one is for you again. Um, where do you see yourself going in the future? The future is now. <laughs> now, nah, um, in the future, honestly, I think that I'm, I'm, I try not to look too far ahead, but I do, um, I do look forward to helping out as many kids as possible, raising my two kids. I have a young daughter whose name is Raven. Um, that's R-A-Y-V-E-N. She's going to be nine in January. And my son, Jalen. And Jalen is going to be four in um, September. And I'm just looking forward to living a complete life. I think when I, I've set goals and I think I've set the, in a, the, the like the professional goals. I think in terms of life goals, I want to be able to be able to go on as many walks in the parks with my kids and play with them until I'm 110 years old. Hopefully I can still walk by then. All right. Thank you uh, again, Mr. Rice. So we have another one directed to you, which is um, what would you say to someone who is afraid to ask for help? Uh, what would I say to someone who's afraid to ask for help? Um, Beth, would you mind telling me if this person is a male or female? Um, hold on, let me check. Uh, sounds like they are male. Uh, Patrick. Oh, uh, uh, Patrick. Um, well. It does not make you less of a man to ask for help. If you're afraid, I think that that's almost part of like you overcoming that fear. And um, once you do ask for that help and you get the right, you understand that it's a burden lifted off your back, I think that you're gonna feel so much better um, if you uh, if you do ask for help, because it's a burden lifted off your back. Like the best thing that ever happened to me was when I asked for help, and it made me it it, it just made me feel like I was free. And um, I really think I, I recommend it to anyone. I think that um, some of the help is right in front of you, and. Um, but I, I, you, are, you should be mindful who you do ask for help. And I think people, everyone that's in this group, CAS, the CIAC, and Encourage, I think we'll all be here, you know, um, if you needed any advice. I think um, you can reach out to uh, one of the directors and uh, we can take this conversation deeper if you needed some extensive help. This is for everyone that spoke. Um, what's one piece of advice you guys would give? It can be for anybody. Hi, can I answer that then? 
Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, the one piece of advice is um, smile. There's so much to enjoy in life. And we are in a very strange period of time right now. We're, um, you know, wondering when things will normalize and we don't really know when. But there's so much else you can be doing with your time and find the things that give you joy and um, make sure that the people that give you joy know how you feel about them and take time to develop your mind and to keep yourself healthy and um, it'll pass and it'll move on and you want to look back on this time because really these kinds of periods have happened in history before the last one was over 100 years ago and you're going to be able to tell your children about this. So make sure there's something wonderful and interesting to tell them. That's my advice. All right, so that was actually um, all the questions we have time for. So if the rest of the panel members also want to respond to that same question that um, Dr. Engel just did, that would probably be a good way to close it out. Um, just for each person to say one piece of advice that they would give uh, to high school students. I think for me, what I would, the piece of advice that I would give really is to piggyback on what Dr. Rangel had said, but most importantly, find balance in your life. Yeah, you're a great, it's a great opportunity right now to learn what's important to you. And I think we all learn the importance of family during this pandemic, but most importantly, taking care of yourself, your schoolwork, your athletics, your extracurricular activities, but maintain a sense of balance. Moderation is the key. Uh, I would say um, at this time in your life that high school athletics or clubs, whatever you do, is a memory, create memories, all right? Make that, make it enjoyable, take part in as much as you can um, and, and just have a lot of fun. Keep smiling, not everything it has to be so serious. Um, Ray, Ray did a lot about social media. Don't think that everybody that's posting things on social media is happy and that you have to compete. Um, just enjoy yourself and, and enjoy your friends and, and know that through this time, a lot of things that we've missed is sometimes that contact with people, not just the Zooms, but, but I know like for me personally right now, I've had some great conversations with Ray in the last two months that have been phenomenal, right? That we haven't had a chance to do. So a lot of times life is a sound bite. So enjoy those moments when you can connect with friends or family. And when you get back together and you're back in your normal routine, and enjoy those and, and make, make, lasting memories out of it and if you want to write a journal about it journal it you know do something to improve yourself um and, and just have a good time I, I have something very uh simple to add uh for each of us it takes a tremendous amount of courage to wake up every morning and to simply be yourself to be comfortable in your own skin and for so many of us, it's a waste of time trying to be uh, a, the person that you think other people want you to be or, or that person that you think other people think you are. Uh, that, that does not lead to a good place in the long run. But I would simply say that have the courage to simply be who you are and be yourself. And I would just say, I'm gonna go to the kids. I'm gonna go to the youth generation's lingo. So growing up, when we got dressed and everything, we always said we wanted to stay fly. So I'm gonna just use fly, meaning first love yourself. Because if you love yourself, you'll do the right thing when you got to take care of everyone else. If you don't love yourself, you're only gonna take care of everyone else because you're forgetting to take care of yourself. So stay fly. First love yourself and have a good time while you're doing it. 
All right, those are all awesome pieces of advice. And uh, thank you guys for all taking the time out of your day today to uh, come and share with uh, the, the younger generation, I guess, your pieces of advice that you have learned over your entire life. Uh, so that actually brings our conference to a close. And we hope that everyone enjoyed today's conference. Um, please look out for the many leadership experiences that we offer throughout the school year. Uh, a feedback form and resources for topics covered will be emailed to you in the next few days. We appreciate your feedback back as we are always looking for ways to improve our leadership experiences and provide resources for you to bring back to your own schools. And thank you for everybody that spoke today. Um, um, yeah, thank you for everybody for speaking and the best of luck to everybody in their 2021 20, school year. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.